Hey there, witches and warlocks, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and as the old spell says, double-double is 5e in trouble, Tasha's burns and nerd rage bubbles. Welcome to Tasha's Cauldron of First Impressions on WebDM. Okie dokie, so welcome to WebDM Talks. Let's get right into it, Jim. These are our first impressions of Tasha's. It's the new hotness, the sure. new thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so Jim, right off the bat, first impressions. What are you? What are you thinking? Is this? Is this what will save Fifth Edition? Is this what will take us into a whole new realm? I hope not. Um, my first thoughts. <laughs> my first thoughts are: I have no strong reactions to this. Like, in in some ways, yeah. that's 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 the worst because like i either i want to feel something i want to have some kind of, of reaction either like screw this this is terrible <laughs> you know like that at least elicits something out of me and says that like whatever i'm reacting to there's a solid viewpoint and like a a, a something you know the authors of the book the designers of the mechanics in it have something to say and something that they want mm -hmm. to come across or it's like i absolutely love this this is great it's amazing but my reaction is just sort of like, meh. Like it's not terrible. It's not great. I'm 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 burned out on subclasses. Like I I get that there's still niches to fill, and there's probably another base class or two that uh, that that could make its way into a fifth edition. Looking at you, psionicist. Um, but <laughs> don't, don't but, even get me started, man. Right, right. <laughs> Um, but at this point, I'm. Whenever they say like it's a rules expansion, I I I feel like that that's not dishonest, but it's not the truth. <laughs> the truth is that the, most of the book is subclass options, and I know that that conforms to like fifth edition's uh, ethos of most of the rules are player facing. It's there to customize their characters, play the kind of character they want to play. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, the book has a lot to offer, but yeah. I think it's disingenuous because when I hear rules expansion, I think of a more holistic approach of like options for players, real options for dungeon masters, and sort of like a addressing or an addressing of the shortcomings and holes that are in fifth edition that we've known about for a long time. And in that sense, I find Tasha's a little bit of ha like a half measure. So like, yeah, they addressed it, but not to the extent that you know that it really addresses uh these shortcomings I'm, and in this case i'm primarily thinking about ranger but there are others um yeah and in that sense i'm just sort of like meh you know i don't know what, what was your sort of first impression uh, with it um looking through like i had read more of the of course read through artificer having played one for the last few months uh playing the ua and so um right, we'll get to you know, pros, cons, and faves in a bit, but uh, I really just read through that at first, and the spells, and then some of the DM tools at the back. Uh, but, like, the last few days, I've been really, like, looking through the subclasses, and where I'm at is I, I am torn between two worlds. Yeah. Uh, the player power gamer in me is like, ooh! Oh! Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the DM in me is just, is like you, it's just kind of like, eh. I mean, <laughs> Like I, I completely agree in that there's a lot of this these a lot of things that they bring up here that it's more of just like the fact that they brought it up is addressing it and not fully addressing it in the rules. Like it's like, well, we talked about that. Now there you go. We're good. Yeah. And I think that um, this talks to like that fifth edition, it's there's millions of people playing it. D and D is as popular mm -hmm. as it's been since the early eighties. It's it's growing it's healthy i'm i'm glad for that it i'm i, I might not i'm not like i might not be all in on fifth edition and like the play style of fifth edition but i am glad that it's here and i think the adage of like it's nobody's favorite but it's everybody's second favorite uh at least those of us who've been playing a while is true like yeah. i i have no i like playing in fifth edition i love playing in fifth edition w running it less so um but yeah, it, I find it's just kind of it's it's either not enough or it's it, it's too much. 
<laughs> like some of the subclasses are like this, these are objectively better than anything in the player's handbook i find oh, that yeah. to be an issue right um so my, my first impression well, is one dis- of power creep as well go ahead well no definitely definitely power creep because when you release things that will disenfranchise people from even considering older options mm. like that like I, there's a difference between filling a niche and like adding a whole level to the game yeah uh, and i think that's what they i think that's closer to what they've done now again yeah. that's the thing is the power gamer gamer in me is like oh wow but then i look back at old options and i'm like why would i ever pick that yeah yeah i'm i'm <clears throat> I'm, at the moment, I'm playing a Beastmaster, not a Beastmaster, but a Totem uh, Barbarian. And while well, I like it, got that resistance, got I can see an absolute mm-hmm. darkness up to a mile away, those kinds of things. I'm going to fly once I, <laughs> once I get to that level because flying Barbarians are cool. Um, like My rage propels me right. from the ground. <laughs> like, I, I'm looking over at Totem of the Beast going like, well, I could be like a, a beast. Like I could literally grow claws and a, and a tail and all that kind of stuff. Or... Uh, really honestly i'm i'm regretting that i rolled barbarian at all and that i didn't make a battlemaster uh fighter because i look at the sort of things that battlemaster keeps getting and i go fighter just keeps getting better and better the longer this goes on yeah um and while rune knight got nerfed it's fine it's all right it's still a, it's still, it's still one of the better <laughs> options for fighter, right? yeah <laughs> yeah uh, so what do you th- what do you think of the customizing your origin stuff the very first stuff that they have and and the things that like honestly since the summer people seem to have been most anticipating and and most sort of uh feel is necessary for D, which honestly these are things that i've had changed in my home games for years right the inherent ability uh, well, scores for different uh you know race options that kind of thing yeah, I don't I don't understand like why I mean I guess I understand why it needs to be codified, but like why haven't you just been doing this? I, I don't I don't know. Like Yeah. Like yeah. It, it's it seems to me that um it's that's a not a very difficult thing to change. Just right. like uh I mean just like um your background, like how mm-hmm. that's just like it literally says these are these are options, like you can change any of this. I don't know why this wasn't already in like the like the origins. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I do. Like I do prefer options, origin to race. Like I think origin is a better, uh, better term for it. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, right. yeah, yeah, your ancestry, whatever. Like, I just don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just right there with you, Jim. I, I, I think. Like, I, I, I'm glad it's there. I guess. Yeah, you know? that's that's kind of my feeling. I, I sort of <laughs> like. Well, that's. I mean, you guys weren't doing that anyway. Like, wh- like, did this need to be codified in a rule book to just? switch things out and and with your dm's permission is usually always the caveat and Mm -hmm. when i think about it, it's like what else would i want out of this what else would i want out of something that like gets rid of the bioessentialism gets rid of the the sort of like uh you know hints of racism and and the the legacy of fantasy role playing and trad fantasy and all that that's made its way to yeah. 21st century D D that a lot of people find like offensive and and a turnoff from the game and like as well they should right <laughs> like if they're uncomfortable with it if they find that uh is something that's a barrier mm-hmm. for them then they sh- they ought to be able to change that but i wanted more than just yeah you can change it swap them out like tell me look at the player's handbook races look at all of the options and tell me what's cultural and what would be considered like essential to this to this being like aarakocra have wings they'll fly right um mm-hmm. but when i look at say something like an elf how much of that is just because elves grow up in elven civilization that they have these these traits these features so i'd like to see a greater discussion of that how to integrate that into the campaign world how to reconcile sort of the idea that the player's handbook options and the options up to this point are represent archetypes that for mm-hmm. many people are are the reason that they're playing D D. that that these are legacy uh elements that they like the positive aspects of them and yet at the same time there are many different ways to play and with the plethora of subclass options and everything else we ought to be able to customize um and and change things as we like 
I would have liked to see more discussion of that. What are the world building implications um, uh, and the like? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I found it was kind of, all right, thanks for the suggestion. Thanks for this bit of homebrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. so the, the next part of that, like as far as uh, offering suggestions or rules about changing your subclass, because I, I actually I actually kind of like this this little area mm -hmm. as far mm -hmm. as just like, you know, like actually giving, uh, you know, at least like a loose layout for, you know, you know, make sure you have some training time. And but if yeah, you yeah. don't like, uh, you know, it's if it's if it's a dramatic one, then, hey. You know, and it gives you some examples at least. I, I do wish it was more than just, you know, like five paragraphs. Yes. Like for me, something like changing your subclass, like, you know, I mean, like that's a big deal. Like when you go to work and you do some cross training, like especially like in pharmacy, mm -hmm. you know, that's a big yeah. deal. That's like a week or that's a, that's a few weeks of just like learning a whole new thing, but it's still built on the same uh, principles, the foundation <laughs> yeah. of fighter. Like say you want to change your fighter subclass, right? And so, um, I don't know. I just, um, I think, it, I think it would be fun to like throw in some, just like not only uh, training time, but like challenges, like you have to overcome these certain challenges to ensure and, and codify and like solidify your new subclass. Yeah. I um, see that. I see what you mean. I, I'd I like would, them to probably do something like that. Yeah. I'd, I'd like them express as, as explicit downtime actions. You know, this takes X number of, of uh, you know, time length to, to accomplish. These are the complications that might arise that might lead to these challenges. Here's how much gold that you ought to spend on training and, and supplies and things like that to make it part of the world and part of what the emerging story of your own campaign and your character's growth through that instead of just this, yeah, you can do it. it here, you know, your DM might have other things you want to do. It's just like... I found like most of fifth edition, it's a lot of suggestions for what you could do without concrete examples or a procedure or tool to follow to do this. And in that sense, Tasha's doesn't break with fifth edition, but I just don't care for that part of this uh, edition of D and D. Uh, yes. Um, trying, uh, <laughs> trying to be vague and, and, and cover all the bases, but not enough specificity to yeah. hammer the point home. The other big first impression I had was that's way too many reprints. Like I, I know that, that not everybody has all the books and adventurers league has mm -hmm. its own sort of rules for, uh, you know, how many books you can use, what options you have. I don't like, I really, it really bothers me. I think that, that the official rules that come out, try to take that into account rather than just modifying the adventurers league rules. Right. Yeah. Like I don't play it. I'm not sure how it works. I might just be completely off base here, but it does feel like I don't really necessarily want to buy a book that assumes this certain style of campaign. If that means that, that how many, how many five subclasses reprinted plus a whole class plus like the group patrons mm -hmm. chapter plus a modification of the sidekick rules. Like there's, it's not nothing. You know, and that could have, that space could have been used for other things, for either other options or, or I must be honest, more class feature variants, uh, or more DM tools that they could use to actually run their adventures. Um, so yeah, that that was my other impression uh, about it. Yeah, it, it it does seem that this book is trying to be set up as the new like AL plus one hot new hotness. Like, right yeah yeah in that sense it's like well I mean, even even if i like the reprints yeah. like i love college of eloquence bard uh i, I think artificer is a great addition and a fun class even if it doesn't fit every campaign you know yeah oh no de definitely uh, it is a hell of a lot of fun i'm now imagining the movie poster for adventures league civil war and it's, <laughs> it's like Team Tasha's, Team Xanathar's. <laughs> you can see it in your head. I know you can. I'll take like, Team Tasha's that, so that's... any day of the week. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, comparatively speaking, with the range of options, yeah. Why the yeah. Why the hell wouldn't you? Uh -huh. uh, just, just. Uh, but yes. Um, take your totem event, beast uh, and uh, and rune knight. Oh. <laughs> Make yourself a Hulk. <laughs> Oof. Man, be, uh, yeah, so I don't. It's so I don't want to be completely negative, right? Like I, I think le critique of a book is legitimate. These are my first impressions, but there's a lot in it that I like, and and if anything, mm -hmm. it's the fact that I like a lot in it that it's like I 
could have used more, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I think it's maybe time to move on to pros, cons, and faves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's get on to some of these pros, cons, faves. Let's talk about some of these uh, subclasses. Now we're not gonna like drill down and like go hardcore and and pick apart all the options. If you want that, maybe bump over to our Patreon and check out our weekly podcast there, where we'll do more of this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Because there are a few a of these that Jim, I wanna I I really want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as far as as far as pros, cons, and faves, I mean, like a a, a short list, like like you said, fighter to me gets a lot like yeah. as much as i am pissed off so, th so this is going to be a, a a pro con all in one sure, sure fighter like it's one of the first places i looked of course fighter and monk is always where i go first yeah. Yeah, yeah. uh so with the psy warrior and the rune knight like those are two badass subclasses that you will be really badass if you ch if you select yeah what pisses me off is i'm sorry but the psionicist to break it apart and just give it pieces of it to different classes. Mm. I, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it to me. It's fuck. It's bullshit. Like, mm. like mm. I'm sorry, make a psionicist. It is, <laughs> it can't be that difficult. It's sure. been in many editions of D and D sure. just do it. Like, yeah, yeah. what is yeah. the deal? Like, why can't we just anyway? Sorry. Are you sure. Well, I'm apart done. from the fact that a whole new <laughs> class is, is a difficult thing to do, which they've tried, right? They've, they've had several iterations of it, but I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. My yeah. the, the thing that that keeps me from joining where you're at 100 percent is the is how I remember older editions of D&D &D playing where you had your class and then you might also be a psionicist. Right, you might yeah. also have psychic powers, and that's modeled with both feats and and these subclass options. And like, who doesn't want to be a Jedi, right? The Psy Knight, <laughs> the Psionic Warrior, whatever, is uh, to me that's oh, yeah. no. that's your Jedi option. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, you're totally a Jedi Knight. Like yeah. it is, you got the jump, you got you got some some force field action. You yeah. can move stuff with your mind. I mean, like it is a great option. And I don't even want to get in on Rune Knight because that is even even nerfed even yeah even powered down from the ua which r.i.p you know we had our moment <laughs> Man, no, it was it was a beautiful shining moment of sun. Right. <laughs> like it was like wait really a fighter yeah. can do all this right. that's kind like, of awesome that's yeah so yeah i agree fighter options were good the, the new fighting styles the new maneuvers those are all fun i i kind of I, I hope that unarmed strike doesn't become something that like monk players feel they have to have right off the bat. But I know you have strong opinions about that. Do you want to save it for the podcast? Or do you I, want to go over it now? I don't, I don't know, man. I just kind of want to let it out. It, 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 Tell it, us what it, you no, really think. And another thing. <laughs> like, seriously, why does a monk have to wait till 11th level to, to hit get the hit <laughs> guy? Yeah. The, the punching hit guy. The people who learn how to fight with their body aren't as good at it. Yeah as a fighter at j that takes this feat. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I get the barbarian getting, getting like the, like the beast mode bite sure, attack yeah. and the tail attack and the claws. Like, you know, you're barbarian, you're going to put out a lot of damage. Mm. And I get that the monk has things to, to mitigate that because they get extra attacks from flurry of blows. Sure. They can always use a different weapon. Right. Instead they of can always fists. use a different yeah. way instead of your fists, but still it's like, really? But a fighter can just, Oh, I'm going to do D eight. <laughs> like straight out, I just learned how to punch things really hard because I'm Rocky and I you punched know. a. And yet side we've of talked about wanting and... strength-based brawlers for six years now. So yeah. it's it's sort and of like so it's a bitter the, pill again. Yeah. It's a bitter pill because it's like, man, I, yeah, I can see how I'd make that fisticuffs guy. I make Tyler Durden now, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but still, Take my monks. Grapple, what, what's up, strike? man? Like, yeah, what's up with that? But yeah, uh, having a monk with a two-level dip is <laughs> or with the two-level dip and fighter, <laughs> hey. and just taking that feat. Got you some action surge. You know, got you a couple yeah. of D10 hit die, yeah. you know. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, for me, the, the standout subclasses uh, are, are Path of the Beast, loving it. I, mm -hmm. I like the mechanics of Path of Wild Magic. I don't like the flavor of it. Um, it you know, I, I, it's just not clicking for me. I, I was, I, I'm right there with you. I'm just trying to, I was trying to figure out how, where would this character come from? Like, yeah. would he just be like a mage's guard that got caught in a, uh, a magical explosion or something? Who knows? Like, yeah. And like, this is what came, you know, yeah. he's, this, and he's yeah. like a Hulk. The, the <laughs> suggestion of like Asmar Tiefling and, and, uh, and Ganassi are, are where I can see it being sort of like coming 
mm. coming from like you're inherently magical anyway but um to move on i i really like the college of eloquence i think it's really cool if you're using the standard dcs from chapter eight of the dmg this class might be broken in terms of its ability to just meet and exceed those d and uh, those dcs that said it is just persuasion it's not a magical ability a lot of that's dm dependent um loving the yeah. circle of stars and circle of wildfire for druids i was you know i was gonna Man. ask you jim what wildfire Man. like that sounds very familiar but that's just because i watched land between two rivers uh, so, yeah yeah so, so i had, as I had far made as an a fire based right yeah <laughs> i had made an offensive like blaster type uh a circle for for a uh, player in that campaign that was like a, you entered like a casting rage which boosted your stats but it cost you hit points the idea was a risk reward sort of thing um i i do kind of think it's it's a shame that they don't really have that many fire spells that firebolt and fireball got taken away from them uh, you know i i'm if I, if I were running it they're back in um but uh, as well as probably some other fire spells but i like the mm -hmm. idea of them right i like the 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 flavor that's going on and stars is like yeah the stars are part of nature too so why wouldn't we have it and also we've played a campaign where this would have been really helpful <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah in our first spell jammer campaign yeah we had a we had a druid who was basically ziggy stardust and we just kind of made like a a, a, a celestial together. kind of yeah we just kind of cobbled together a celestial druid mm -hmm. uh, but yeah this would have been really helpful and this is what would have what what uh, they would have played i'm sure yeah um yeah i would what, what you thinking about that uh the monk the way of the astral self because when this Love ua it. came yeah. out and and I didn't I don't think they really changed that much from the UA. Yeah, I haven't gone like, into it like in depth er, yet. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I was like looking through it, like getting those astral arms to get some extra attacks, and like having like giving yourself like dark vision, and all the all the all the abilities that you 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 cloak yourself in with your astral self. Like I love. I mean, I don't mind that it costs some key uh, to all. Yeah. activate all these abilities because they're all very useful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where like, if you want to do like, basically like what I love about it is after seeing Dr. Strange, like yeah. I, I know what this looks like. Yes. I don't have the magic, but it's still like, I know exactly what this looks like. And like, imagine your own soul coming out of your body to help you fight. And like, mm -hmm. if that's not mastery over oneself, like, I don't know what is. And so it's one of those things where the mechanics and the th the theme of it really mesh. Like, and I'm just like sitting here, you know, waiting to play a monk of the astral self. Like, really, like I right. probably one of my next characters. Yeah. Yeah. Using some so. of the origins options, maybe maybe making a gith yonki as way of the astral self oh. who's like perfected that oh. while living in Turnerath. And, you know, oh, when they dude. come to the material plane, <laughs> they can like, ex you know, extend that uh, in, into their own. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I love astral self. Like even if it was a garbage class mechanically, I love the idea of it. Um, say the yeah. way of, same with the way of mercy. Right. I love that it's a, a yeah. class where it's like they can hit you or harm you. They, they have to me that speaks to like they really do have a mastery over this flow of of, of energy that kind of expresses itself yeah. as key and and could be used for a variety of things not digging the mask mm -hmm. I'm probably not gonna have probably not, would never enforce that but the i was the, I, that part confused me but i, I think they so just also wanted doctors they were, like, yeah i think somebody <laughs> just wanted to have the plague the the, the plague mask uh which okay, yeah you know uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll just make a Kenku. Right. <laughs> is that a is that a mask? I go. It's just my face. It's just my face. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Uh, it, so from there, the the two paladin options. Eh, Oath of Watchers is is cool, but I don't like the idea of it. But I don't know that much about the mechanics to really come down on either side. I will talk about the Ranger in a minute. Uh, although Fey Wanderer is a <laughs> is a cool idea for it. Not sold on Swarm Keeper, but that's. Doesn't you want matter. to be a beekeeper? Just, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> like the idea of it, I'm like, I kind of get it. Feels like it, a but... druid thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, thank you. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's like, um, one but I like thing. that. I like that rangers get like druidic warrior, right? That they can pick up some cantrips. Mold earth. Pays for the love of God, take mold earth for one of those. Make yourself some cover uh, for, uh, yeah. for your ranged character, you know. Um, Thorn whip's another good one for, uh, for ranger. Um, but yeah. then we get to like oh, definitely for for ranger 
Yeah. I have never liked the Phantom for Rogue, but I don't want to get into what I don't like yet. We can talk about that uh, here in a minute. Aberrant Soul Sorcerer. Or, ab sorry, Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. Man, like, I I got to play one of these. I, I got to mix it with some great old one packed magic, you know, dip into Warlock or something. I just love the idea of it. First off, if I'm remembering correctly, I don't have the book in front of me. They can squeeze through one inch spaces. And I don't know what it is, but that ability in a character to squeeze through tiny spaces is something I want. I've got to play a character that can do that. There's options in Cobalt Press supplements that give you that. But um, if I now I might just be completely misremembering and talking about something that's not. No, 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 no. I, I have it up on my computer here. No, it's I, yeah, it's 14th level. That's that's one of your oh, features 14th. is Man. you can squeeze through as narrow as one inch. And all I, all I can think of is that squid squeezing through that hole outside the boat and just like thinking about that. Like, yeah. That's in that's that's some, that's some crazy the thing that's some the excuse me the blob yeah uh, like, underneath the like, door through a keyhole yeah all mm -hmm. kinds of things there's it, and like I said it's it's in most cases it's probably a ribbon ability but the fact that you can is enough for me to go yeah I'll take that fourteenth level I'll wait for mm -hmm. it. I'll wait for it. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll be worth it. Don't worry. <laughs> it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it just to be creepy. Um, so I really, I really like that one. And then like the genie warlock. First off, get wish. Come on. Why wouldn't you want that? Limited wish as well. Get to live inside a genie's bottle. What's not to like? I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like I just like the fact that it's not even uh, that it's just part of their their uh, expanded spell list yeah and, and handing hand, handing someone a wish every day just like there you go have it. i mean why wouldn't you it's <laughs> it's, it's perfect theme <laughs> it's so. very perfect like you know and even before then i think there's a lot to offer and there's a lot of good melding of, of mechanics and flavor and and to me it makes perfect sense the first time i read warlock in the php i was like where's our genie why can't i have a genie um so i've been waiting on this <laughs> one for six years um, and I, I love the fact that each of the genie types has its own separate list, and it really does make me want to go, all right, let's look at the Archfey. How many different kinds of Archfey can we think of? Can we think of three to four? Let's give them their custom lists. How many different fiends can we think of? There's, surely there's a difference between a devil patron and a demon patron, right? What kind of great yeah. old ones are we talking about, right? Um, using the classic, classic mythos, there's a difference between Cthulhu and Azathoth, and and uh Nyarl Athotep, Nyarl right? Like, right right yeah, yeah they're all they'll have different shticks <laughs> going on uh mm. and so having different spell lists uh is a good way to do that without needing to redesign a whole subclass you know so oh, like oh yeah because i mean when you when you think about archfey like why isn't there one for the su summer court why isn't there one for the winter court if you have the goblin king as your patron, you know, like, I, and that's just the three off the top of my head that I can think of, but there are countless other fey types. Um, if you have a fairy godmother, like, I yep. mean, she should be a whole different kind of magic yeah, than, yeah. than the others. Fairy uh, godmother's a great one. I never thought of that. That'd be awesome as a warlock patron. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> like, I, I'm, you know, to me, moving on to wizard... That's fine. I've 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 seen Blade Singer before. Um, it's good, you know. It it can be it can be very OP. It cannot. A lot depends on who's playing it, um, and how you play it. And how you play it. Like I find that I, I, I find it's funny that Blade Singer is OP when you play it not to what it's to, yes to what it's meant to be. Right. But just like no, I just want to be a wizard, wizard with an insanely high AC that stays out of shit and just never gets touched. I've done that. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's pretty ridiculous even at low level. Uh, the whole removing the elf uh, thing, like, again, this is one of those things of like, people were doing this at their tables anyway. So, like, I, I, I don't it, know. It, it is a Whatever. nitpick. <laughs> it is a nitpick, but it, it gets under my Pick skin, that too. Nit. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> scribe. Okay. Like, I'll, I probably, it's probably on my list of options for wizard. I, I, I kind of left wizard fifth edition wizards behind a while ago and realized i had more fun at a, as a player when i played non-casters uh, or or mm -hmm. half casters or something like that uh and so i've kind of largely been like you know what next edition i'll give wizard a try i'm gonna take this edition off uh for for the wizard um 
And so, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm less up to uh, speed on, on how wizards are playing and how it'll affect them. But it's interesting, you know. It, there's got there's a lot of neat features there, uh, but it's not like on my list of oh my god, I got I would like to play a cla- a character of this class, you know. What is your absolute favorite of the of, subclasses? Of the subclasses? Yeah. Man, that's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, so I it, it's probably down to College of Eloquence. Um aberrant mind and uh-huh. circle of wildfire those are probably my top yeah. three not gonna not gonna choose between them I'm, I'm gonna gonna keep them you know in a triad of yeah of faves um but more than yeah. more uh, than subclasses uh, like the way i look at these is these are fodder for alternate class abilities that your other php <laughs> subclasses could have like these are rewards that you hand out to you know your your old busted PHP <laughs> subclasses well, as luckily, like a reward for well, something, luckily, you know. <laughs> yeah, and luckily they gave you rules for changing subclasses from you your change, old you busted just, to the new hotness. Take so. this one, yeah. Um, you know, know, wink, wink, <laughs> nudge, nudge. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, uh, for me, another like, you know, a bit of pro, a bit of con are the class feature variants. And I really like that UA that came out uh, earlier with the class feature variants was like, I like this is canon for me. This is in my, you know, when I run fifth edition again, this is, these are the options. And I thought it was a great step forward. I thought it was a refreshing sort of update for, for classes that, that might be just sort of lackluster, you know, this far into fifth edition. And so like seeing some of them make it here was very nice the fact that some of them are just things you get you don't have to replace another feature with them i thought was a great little just benefit um and to me like the new spell editions you know those have been long overdue the fact that wizards have don't have some of the better divination spells it's kind of long overdue um the fact that um to stick with wizards that they can change up their cantrips is one of those things i think more than any other caster when i hear someone's just sort of like this is bullshit it's that wizards are locked into these cantrips and yeah. i'm gonna leave spell versatility aside i don't care for it but i understand a lot of people like it if you like it you do you bring it back to your game um but cantrip uh was a cantrip formula is one of those that i love for wizards and might be the one thing i was like all right if i was going to play one this will bring this will be the tipping point for me um Mm-hmm. I like some of the Ranger class feature variants. I like Deft Explorer. I like Druidic Warrior. I'm going to talk about the others in a minute. Um, but for uh, some of the others, like th- the th- Pruitt, you can make your thrower <laughs> for six years. Yeah. You might, you've been anguishing over how you make your knife throwing character, and it's back. It's there. What do you think? I, I mean, I, I, I honestly. Uh... <laughs> I haven't looked at that yet because I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to see it because I don't, I don't want to be disappointed. Um, so, um, I'm not going to lie. Like, I haven't really you like haven't, read. Haven't read... <laughs> yeah. I'm, gonna be, I'm, I'm just going to be it. honest with it. I think if I was, if, um, if I was going to make it, one of the changes I would make is a change to sharpshooter. Because as it stands, sharpshooter is incompatible with throwing because it keys off of a ranged weapon, of which throwing weapons are not. They're melee weapons you can throw. Um, yeah, and so I would, I would make a change yeah. uh, from that. Um, but yeah, I like it. I like the fact that there's a strength brawler. I love the grappling strike maneuver where you hit him and now you can grapple. It's a melee attack, so that means it works on melee spell attacks, right? So you can do a little bit of shocking mm-hmm. grasp or something else to, uh, to grab hold of them. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of class future variants overall, and I'm glad to see them. Wanted more of them. I'd have taken a whole book of them, replaced all the subclasses, just give me class future variants. Like maybe that's not everybody's opinion. That was mine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you, man. Um, Any other yeah, faves? I, uh, well, I would say my my probably my phase. I am torn. Uh, I'm torn between the two fighter options Psy warrior rune knight and uh, way of the astral self <laughs> like i'm back to good old-fashioned pruitt where he started 
like in the fighters and, and the fighters. monks, and just yep. like like I I want to do all of those. I want to do all three of those. <laughs> can I can I just do like a Gestalt three way yeah. character creation? Like, <laughs> don't even bring up Gestalt. Just all of them. Don't even don't even open that door. Uh, <laughs> I want to make a character named Gestalt of Rivia. Uh, <laughs> There you go. There you go. Um, that might be my favorite joke I've ever made on Rivia. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, uh, anyway. As, as for the rest of the book, group patron stuff's nice. I think a lot of it is, is again, sort of suggestions and, and the like that, that, um, that are lacking that mechanical heft. Um, the mm-hmm. spells and, and whatnot, I just wish there were more spells uh, and, and that the summon spells were more widely distributed, you know? Changes to Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade, man, I was not on. I did not realize that they were so controversial till this came up. I didn't realize like that Shadow Blade and Sorcerer with these things were such a big combo. I could see it. I could see why that that yeah. uh, would really <laughs> rankle some people if that's how they base their character on this sort of combo. Mm-hmm. Do you do you? It's your game, your table. I know if you don't have a DM that's that's letting you do that, or if it's Adventures League, that's not an option for you. But Mm-hmm. I, you know, this is one of those things where if I'm playing, it's like, yeah, you can use the old versions, you know. Um, but I, for spells, I, I, I think like you were saying when you first got it, that you wish there was more rituals. I could see some more rituals. Oh, dude. You know, it's literally the first thing I scrolled down the list, and I was like, why did you even include the column that says ritual, just so you could print the word no twenty times? <laughs> like, like, what? Like, what was the purpose? Like, I mean, seriously, I, I feel you just put that, a yeah. line at the front. It's like, there are no new rituals. No rituals and like, here. that's a less, you know, <laughs> I, I guess you got to get paid by the word count. I don't know, sure. but can we get just a ritual? And like, uh, what's that spell? Um, dream of the blue veil. You love? I love dream. Why of the isn't blue that veil? a ritual? That's a whole campaign right there based on that one spell. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, a it's ritual? a six hour, it's a six hour ritual. It would be when I'm playing. It's a six hour ritual. I mean, it's, a, yeah. it's six hours. Like, why don't you just make that eight hours? It's a ritual that you do in your, like, as you sleep and like, and you, what, cross over to freaking new, camp, new yeah, world. Cross over, like, like, have, <laughs> we, we get a lot of questions at WebM about like, how do I introduce new stuff for my, my old campaign without completely starting over? How do I incorporate new material, whatever? And this is your spell. Right, give an NPC that can cast it for the party, a scroll, a magic item, or whatever gives you an excuse to be like, Well, you know what? This week we're adventuring in these prime material planes, you know, and that's this material we're going to use. And you can literally have a mm-hmm. world hopping campaign. Maybe they're being chased by uh, enemies, so they have to keep hopping from world to world. You know, the inevitables that's are gonna catch up with them eventually because you're not supposed to do that, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but there it is. Oh no, yeah, you have your inception campaign. Right. Like, right. Uh, like <laughs> uh, right. uh magical tattoos I haven't really looked that into, but I will say one thing before we can move on to, to sort of the things that we wish were were different. I love the cauldron of rebirth. I don't really look at all the magic items. Looks like there's a lot of cool spell books for wizards, some other stuff for casters. Cauldron of Rebirth is one of those magic items that, like, this feels magical. You put a body mm-hmm. in a cauldron, you cover it with 200 pounds of salt. Like, that feels magical, right? It's not just this thing casts Ray's dead. Well, great, okay. But, like, you have to do a thing. You have to have the salt on you, which I think should be more than 10 gold, but that's another nitpick. Um, it, it feels like a fo- it feels folklorish. It feels fairy tale, right? Uh, yeah. you know, what's the effect of this on, on the character? Do they come out <laughs> dry and dehydrated? You know, like what is it that's going on, uh, in, in the fiction a glass of related water. to magic? Yeah. Uh, I think one, uh, what was that? What was that one item that looked really cool? Oh, the, uh, the crystal and chronicle. Mm, mm, um, mm. I, I mean that to me, it, it has a nice, uh, nice, uh, array of spells that you mm-hmm. can cast with it. Um, uh, I just and maybe it's just the art because I will say that's one thing about this book is the art, top notch. There's a lot like, of great art in it, and, and the layout's nice. You know? A lot of really cool art. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Visually, it's 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 interesting. It's not a lot of big columns of text. It's not a lot of big wall, you know, mm-hmm. blocks of it. It's it's not a lot of uh, you know, just sort of drab sameness. Each page is sort of different than the other. So visually, it kind of keeps you interested and and and, mm-hmm. and engaged while you're reading it. Is the information presented in the best way? 
Eh, probably not, but I'm not expecting much out of out of a mainstream, you know, uh, you know, D and D or otherwise uh, RPG book in that sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the devotee uh, sensor that one uh, that one oh, is also a pretty fun like cool. flail. Very cool. Wanna... Right. What about uh, what? Didn't, what didn't you like? My biggest thing is just like I want more for the DM, not just a few suggestions, because it's what's been in popular conversation in in D and D on D and D forums, um, which I feel like that's what a lot of this is, at least the in the DM tool section. Right. Um, which we haven't really we haven't really gotten to specifically yet. Not yet, not uh, yet. I think there's a lot of fun stuff but, in the DM tools, but yeah. I, I mean, I just want more. That's the thing is, I just I want more as a DM to help run my game and. Uh, yeah, agreed, know. agreed. Uh, what's there know. is great. I really like what's there, um, but uh, the, you know the other sort of, I don't know, what do you say? It's, it's just not enough. Like the session zero oh, stuff yeah. is like, I don't need all this just to be like, don't be a dick. Don't be a jerk. Maybe other people do, right? I, you know, maybe you've never run a session zero before. You don't really not quite know what it entails, but I, I felt like it was too much of basically just suggestions. And like we mentioned before, I find that's a lot of what fifth edition does. It's all over the DMG. It's all over a lot of stuff. It's just like, you might want to do this. You might want to do that. You do this and that. It's like, what about a checklist? What, a, what about just a, what do you do? Like specific questions that you ask in a session zero. That would have been, uh, been nice. Maybe it's buried mm -hmm. in there somewhere I didn't see. But yeah, I, I would like to see more out of the DM tools uh, section. Going back to the uh, the session zero section, where most of it is just like the social contract, which yeah, I mean everybody should do that. Like you're all at a table together, sure. but again, we should already know that. Um, but it sh you know it should be reinforced. But then you go to game customization, and it's literally like t like a paragraph and like five questions. When it's just kind of like that's the part where like in my session zero, and when I use my questionnaires, I like. That's the most important thing for me because yeah. it allows me to give the players the best game up front. Like, not just like, I came up with this cool idea and I think they're going to like it. Like, no, no, no. I've asked them the questions. What kind of games they play? What kind of movies, TV, whatever do they intake? Okay, they're more like action-oriented. Oh, this person's more puzzle-oriented. So we're going to have an action scene with some puzzles in there. Right. And it gets everybody involved. Like, But, like, I had to figure that out over a while and so mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. something a little bit more codified i mean like they're in there like these there's like five basic questions in there but like digging down to get the info that you need from your players uh based on what characters they want to make and like yeah. like getting them to talk to one another and yeah. like creating a group that is that is coherent even if it's not coherent it doesn't matter sure like sometimes sure. Mo the most random ass group works look at yeah, guardians of the yeah. galaxy Lo and, and a so, lot of that is play uh, style and I, <clears throat> I see where you're coming from my my take on it is that having this in the rules might be nice but it's it's because this is a play style issue because this is a group dynamic issue having it codified in the rules and having sort of like a section on it isn't gonna necessarily stop the sort of behaviors that it's meant to prevent and like i don't want to say cut it out entirely it actually should have been in the dmg but mm -hmm. i also feel like it's not the right kind of advice for a session zero and there's there is that kind of thing out there in in D and D world and in, in the blogosphere called the same page tool and we'll throw up a link for it uh, and it's a specific list of questions and it's long <laughs> you know you don't need all of them yeah uh, but it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So what, what do you think about parlaying with monsters, Jim? <sighs> it's another love hate. I like that we've got like a, like I like that there's suggestions for like what knowledge skills. Uh, tied to what uh, monsters I, I sort of created my own list a long time ago, but it's nice to see something official. I love mm -hmm. the tables of like what these creature types want. Like that's gold. That that is really going to be helpful for talking to monsters. 
two pages though. Oh yeah, actually gold is on the list. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? Two pages. And they don't even <laughs> reference they don't even reference the the uh the DMG's guidelines for interacting with NPCs and how to sway them and how to uh, interact with them. Like mm -hmm. that, that relates to a larger criticism I have of fifth edition, but I wanted way more out of this section than what we got. Uh, and in this sense, it's another mm -hmm. one of those missed opportunities. Another one of those like, Hey guys, we know there could be more. This might be something that's really useful. You could hang entire adventures on something like this. This could literally change the course uh, of, of the campaign in ways that are, not silly or stupid or or whatever but something that like really is meaningful and and highlights the complexities of these worlds especially if you're going to get rid of alignment which go for it like having something that encourages interactions other than combat what's the what's what's the xp for getting one of these monsters to back down because you gave it something they want and now you've placated it is it equal to their cr is it not you know more is what I wanted from this. And when I start thinking of things like that, I start looking at like other D&D supplements that had what I wanted and they're lacking here. The adventure creation tools from Ravnica, Theros, and Saltmarsh. Like, can we not get like some, what, like the group check procedure from Saltmarsh and how it relates to like hazards on the high seas when you're sailing. I would have loved a few pages of just generic ones you know, that you could use for uh, for a variety of, of exploration challenges. Um, the kind of mm -hmm. adventure locations in Salt Marsh, where it's like, here's a coral reef. It's got some stuff. Do you need an adventure right now? Do you not have something prepared or your players did something you weren't expected? You can turn to this page. Here's like three pages of the map. Here's what's going on. It's not a full session's worth of stuff, but it's enough of a skeleton to hang, uh, uh, you know, something on. And in that sense, like not seeing those really makes it feel like you, you guys know you've published them before, right? Like you guys are aware this is in other books. Like, can we not get something more? <laughs> you know, can we not get more to the group yeah. patrons that looks like Ravnica, right? Can we not get more to like interacting with the gods and 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 the like from uh, you know from you know from Theros? And so Theros, yeah, it feels like a missed opportunity. It really does. Um, and, you know, I, I, at this point, it kind of dovetails into a critique of fifth edition, or not, you know, or just a, you know, the state of the game six years in. Um, and so. Well, I mean, here we know. are six years in with the new hotness out. And, like, how do you think, uh, like, fifth edition is looking? And what do you, what do you extrapolate it being after Tasha's is getting you, uh, after Tasha's gets used at more tables and, like, the state of the hobby in general, like moving forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know that there's anything to do about power creep. I think that the economic incentives of running an RPG company and who's going to buy books, who's the larger market for buying books. It's not DMS, it's players like giving them something, giving them an incentive to buy these books. Uh, and the fact that there's player and DM material in them is nice, but I also kind of like them split up sometimes, um, means that power creep seems to be inevitable. Especially as the edition grows and, and the designers learn more about their system, they're willing to experiment, try new things, that it kind of becomes hard not to introduce power creep without just recycling the old material constantly. And if anything, mm -hmm. the lackluster options are, <laughs> I see as indicative of them trying to rein in power creep, but then the options become bland and flat, sort of boring. So it's this paradox that we've seen over and over and over again in the RPG hobby. And if we play long enough and you, and you've, you know, it, it, a part of the hobby long enough, you will notice and see that like, this has happened before this happened with white wolf. This happened with TSR second edition D and D this happened in third edition, not familiar enough with fourth edition to say, but if I was betting on it, I'd probably say it happened in fourth edition. This idea that you have to keep churning out material that people will buy so that you have a constant revenue stream means that power creep seems like it's inevitable could be off on that could be wrong but i don't know how to square that circle of a company needing to make money to be a viable business and 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 yet ignoring their largest customer base but then getting their larger customer base to buy something that they don't want right and and over and over and over again in the various online communities of dnd you see this call for we want more crunch we want more options we want more 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 I don't know how you deal with that, except 
to give the options that were original, that, that were in the original PHP and came out six years, six years ago, a boost. And in that sense, I wanted to see more from the class feature variants. I wanted to see something that's like, here are alternate class features for these specific subclasses. We're going to look at each one of them individually mm -hmm. and create things for them to be like, this replaces these specific features from these domains or this archetype or whatever, so that the players who want to play those classes, but not feel like they are deliberately choosing something that's going to be a, it's not going to be the kind of character they want to play at that table. Maybe they feel pressure to like, make a character that's going to contribute the most, or maybe they they like to make the most optimized, powerful character for what they want to do. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're closing off options because they aren't getting an update, then it, it does sort of feel like, well, I mean, like I'd like to play one of these others, but I, you know, I'd also don't want to be a drag on the party who are all playing these new things that are going to be not better than me, but more opportunities to influence the game and more opportunities to do sort of like embody their character archetype in a way that's interesting. If you don't care about that, then more power to you. You know, I play player's handbook classes most of the time. I love champions, you know? <laughs> and, and so, I, I, but I want an update, not a 5.5. I don't think it needs a whole new revision, but this was a missed opportunity to say, we recognize that we're six years in and we need, it needs a fresh coat of paint. It needs an update. The underlying structure of fifth edition is great, right? It, it is, it sings. It's, it seems to be a blend. <clears throat> it seems to be a blend of some of the best parts of prior edition D and D and created something that's robust that you can make all kinds of other games out of that, that the fact that you can take this, this structure and make di whole different genres of game or that you can emulate something that people for years within the hobby have been like, you can never do a Lord of the Rings game in role-playing. And yet Adventures in Middle-Earth is amazing. It uses the 5th edition yeah. engine, right? That we're not seeing more of that, more willingness to push the boundaries, more willingness to um, take a look at the base rules and what came out in 2014 and go, well, we could have used more of this. You know, we, we offered suggestions here, but let's offer concrete examples and procedures for dungeon masters to follow. And I feel like something like rulings, not rules is, is hindering this edition at this point. I love the fact that we went from the constraints on DMs from third and fourth edition of like, this is what you have to do and the effect that had on the player base. But I feel like we've gone too far in the opposite direction. And we've left DMs out to dry, <laughs> you know, in terms of like, there are these awesome characters that have all these cool things and they're going to trounce your monsters. They're going to run roughshod over your, uh, you know, over your campaign and the adventures that you've made. It, and it, it might be wacky and silly and incongruous with the kind of game you want to run. Something extra for the DMs, something for them to structure their games around, to give them support. It's not, it doesn't take away their judgment. It doesn't take away their ability to homebrew or, or to adapt their campaign to the needs of the players and their group. But there needs to be more than just, I don't know, make it up yourself. You know, the way vision and cover and obscurement and hiding and stealth work is one of those things where it's like, I, I could we get a better, more clarified example of this? The wilderness exploration mm -hmm. rules haven't been put together in one place till that kit that just came out, the wilderness exploration kit, which I also picked up. It was really cool. Um, that until then they're all over the place split between the PHB and the DMG. The fact that the monster manual, it seems like they gave up after the D section <laughs> and, and are just like, eh, you know, <laughs> angels, beholders, dragons, demons, devils. Great. Those are some cool monsters man, we got through that D and now we're done. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Give us a rule book that has like concrete things. We can always max out hit points. We can always max out damage. Those are low hanging fruit. Give us something else. Give us DM something more. And the number of times at web DM that we hear people go like, yeah, I really feel like as a DM, the players just walk all over what I prepare and they're kind of bored with it at some eventually the dms are bored running those fights and and they don't know what to do they don't know how to solve this issue 
like telling them make up whatever you want ruling not ru rulings not rules is like cold comfort to the dms who are like well can i get an example of what that looks like can you give me a procedure or a tool or whatever to follow and so in that sense like i really think that that if fifth edition needs something it is a book that's more geared towards dms that's more geared towards like helping them and supporting them and the flip side of this or, or, or complementary to this is like creating adventures that are easier to run <laughs> that don't require you to read the whole book and and process what you know the the, the way that they've laid it out and and presented the information into an actual adventure um i really think that that's necessary at this point and eventually you might get dms just giving up the ghost and just be like it's too difficult it's too much like i have to do too much work the prep is 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 uh, you know a burden all to like have the players walk all over the, <laughs> their game and it's not that they should be mm -hmm. that the players should be punished and and kept down and that they shouldn't have uh you know an ability to influence the game it's just my perception of it now which is informed a lot by how people interact with web dm is that at this point the balance is too much in favor of the players and especially as more and more options come out that's only going to get uh further and balance things so a rules update more support for dms and when i say more support i'm talking about like go read theros ravnica and salt marsh in the dm sections there and that's what i'm talking about that's the kind of yeah. support that i'm that i'm looking for as well as an update to the monsters um you know <sighs> the other thing i'm thinking of for fifth edition and i know i've talked a lot but this mm -hmm. is obviously a soapbox i've built um is that i mm -hmm. don't know that there's any wow factor in it when I think of like, what's the one book I would take from here to another edition? I come up scratching my head. Third edition, man, there's so many books from third edition that I still use every time I sit down to prep. There's books in fourth edition that I never used in the game there, but that I've picked up since that I love just reading and being inspired by and taking those things and translating them to fifth edition. And then the further back you go in Dungeons and Dragons, the more I like bringing in. And when I think about fifth, I'm like, Santa Thar, so there's fun stuff in there. Morden Kynan's Tome of Foes, like I really like the monster customization. I really like the monster customization yeah. stuff in there, but like, what adventure is there that's like, this defines the edition? I don't think it's Curse of Strahd. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> That's the one I always go to because <laughs> that's the most fun I had in one of the adventures that sure. come out. Sure. But I think that was more of uh, on the DM and, the, and us playing uh, and making the fun out of it. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's always going to be the case. We had a great time running this adventure because your group did, but like classics. And at some point I start looking at the classic adventures of D&D &D and it's like, why are most of them why were most of them written in the first like five years of the eighties? <laughs> what is it about these modules that were created in the first decade or so of D and D that stand out as classics that people still refer to, that people still recommend that still get reprinted. And in some cases like updated to the current edition constantly. And then I look at like others and I'm like, I, I don't know. Third edition has red hand of doom, right? Red hand of doom is a great campaign. Some of the earlier Pathfinder adventure paths when Paizo was doing Dungeon Magazine, great. They're really awesome and fit with a modern style of D&D. &D. And I just don't see that. I could be just, you know, it might be that the edition has passed me by and I just need to get on a porch, grow my beard out and, and become a grumpy old man, which I'm already halfway there. But I, I'm, I, I want that wow. I want that like, holy crap, I'm going to use this all the time. Like, I want this book next to my bedside table. I want to use, I want it to wear it out, right? And I just can't think of anything that's like that for 5th edition. In the Wizards of the Coast is put out. There's a lot of great third-party supplements that uh, I don't want to go over right now, but uh, that I think beat that, um, including Adventures Middle-Earth. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I think that's where we're at. I like the edition. Want to see it continue. Don't want to see a 6th edition. Don't want to see a 5.5. I think those would not be good. I think they'd be bad for the hobby and are not needed, but an update, a fresh coat of paint and, and to look yeah. at the existing holes and, and really seek to address those. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, cause when you, when you're, when you're building something, 
the most important thing is the foundation. And so when you look back at those first books and you see the holes that need to be renovated and patched and, and, and gaffed over and all of that, uh, like I said, there's a lot of that that still needs to be done. I think one of my, one of my biggest critiques of, of D and D, um, is just the, um, the reference material. Like when you're reading something in the book and I long time viewers of the show know that I'm about to talk about cipher, but like when you're reading the books and you're looking at various things that are mentioned other parts of the book or in other books, just have a page reference off to the side. Like yeah. that is not that hard to do. And it, it, it makes, it makes navigating these books that much easier Oh, I'm reading about this thing that uses this mechanic found on page 162. Flip over to 162. Okay, cool. Um, or found in, in the DMG on page whatever. Like when you're talking about the, the vision uh, re requirements and, and anything surrounding stealth and vision, all that. Why isn't, why isn't that in the PHB referencing the DMG and vice versa? So that if you're not going to put them all in one place, at least you're specifically telling a person well you can check the dmg for these rules and they complement this like yeah. it's just very simple basic things you don't have to rewrite the book you just have to make better reference pages like give me the reference numbers right. uh so that i can more easily navigate uh, yeah. what you already yeah. have yeah. like like simple things like that i think would would i don't know they'd just be a massive boon to yeah, dms everywhere we're not talking major revisions. We're not talking like major reconstructions of it. We're talking about like clarifications on some things that are confusing. For me, it's like, all right, what do the passive skill roles really mean? Because the section in the player's handbook, it's pretty explicit. This represents the average score you would take if you continue to do the same action over and over and over again. And yet in most adventures and other material, it's presented, passive perception is presented as a radar, essentially. And like, can we get some clarification on that? Why is it that the adventures and other material, and it, it moves way beyond passive skills, why don't they seem to reference each other? Why don't they seem to be integrated into a cohesive whole? Why is it that when I look through Icewind Dale, it doesn't seem like it matches up with the exploration rules from the DMG in the player's handbook? Why is that? And my suspicion is that they don't want any one book to be essential, or they don't want to feel like, okay, you can only spend the money on this one thing and i think that's also why we get a lot of reprints but then it creates an, a, a system or, or an addition where it feels like everything is siloed and and not fully integrated into itself and and then the, also the fact that it's it's vague and well, it's rulings not rules fix it yourself it's like well can we figure out whether or not you need thieves tools to pick a lock Right. Okay. What proficiency do I actually use with that? It's a minor thing, but it's also one of those where, why is it this vague? Anyway, I could keep going. It's just going to get more and more nitpicky um, and, and ranty. But um, those are my sort of overall thoughts and yeah. what I wished Tasha's would address. You know. Yeah. What else? No, I'm 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 right there with you, man. Um, it's it's a lot of fun stuff, but some of it doesn't go far enough. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to end on a positive note. I love yeah. Tasha. I love Igle Wilf. She's one of my favorite NPCs uh, and characters from D&D &D lore. Raised by Baba Yaga, the, the lover of Graz. Graz is the demon lord. Right, you know, author of the Demonomicon. She pulled one over on Mordenkainen. Pulled one over on Zagig. Uh, she's like a really cool character to introduce. Mm -hmm. The snarky comments aside, some of them are funny. Some of them are, eh. Like... The, this sort of introducing this character into the lore and like bringing this out and going like, you know, we've got these kinds of characters too that you can use. I've used Tasha in a lot of campaigns, either directly or indirectly. So I'm glad to see her <laughs> uh, front and center. I'm glad to see the, the vignettes from her life and, and you know, sort of the uh, lore surrounding her brought uh, to the fore in the same way that like Xanathar's and Mordenkainen and, and Volo were. So uh, kudos to Wizards of the Coast. Glad let everybody know that this this character has been around for a while, for a long time, and mm -hmm. to sort of update and present her to a new edition is really cool. And she's awesome. User in your campaigns, villain, patron, ally, whatever. She's great. 
you know, if you have any more questions, why don't you come over to our uh, Patreon? You can ask those questions, and uh, Jim and I will answer them because that is uh, that's part of what we do. Yeah. Speaking of, we're about to answer one right now. What are your considerations for making combat tactically interesting, especially for creating movement, while keeping the Gonzo dial turned down? Mm. Um, yeah. Well, for me, I think one of the one of the default. Um, one of the default uh, arenas for combat <laughs> is in a place that has a flat surface. So I think sure. that one of the most interesting things you can do is have your combat in a place that is atypical, in a place right. that is at an angle, in a place that is falling apart, whether it's a sinking ship or in a dungeon that has had a lot of you know uh, seismic activity, so all the tunnels are cracked and at an angle. <laughs> like what <laughs> I'm thinking of is... Uh, um, in um, Star Trek Beyond when they're having that scene after the Enterprise wrecks and they're like literally the ship is flipping over but so this everything's changing like the like oh the, sure the scenery itself is changing and is forcing you to move to more secure footing yeah like things like that like yeah. have the environment change so that you are forced and it, that, that's not gonzo. That's just that's reality happening around your fight. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's one way easily is just, you know, change the terms of, of where the engagement happens and um, and what is happening in that area. Oh, for certain. Yeah. The the whole, you know, that the the, the you know, let me gather my thoughts for a minute. Uh, there are two ways, and I think you're describing the the terrain, the the battlefield itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. I'm thinking of levels. Like levels is the most basic thing. Having different degrees of height uh, and and maybe depth, oh, yeah. um, places where you know the the you have a group of say ranged enemies and they are a elevated position that cannot easily be reached. Right. Like that, that if it's a dungeon, mm -hmm. like the way to get to the balcony where they're at is through another room. Right. It's not like in the same room. It's sort of slightly out of reach. So it, it, that gives people who can climb really fast or teleport or something like that an opportunity. Um, lots of cover. Oh, misty step. Misty step. Right. Mm -hmm. um, tons of cover. Right. Like everybody can be behind cover and then it kind of becomes a game of, of hopping between cover to cover of, um, you know, delaying your attack or holding your action and then like using that reaction. Like I know it's not it's I would let me phrase it in a more positive sense. It switches things up. I, I know that there's a, a kind of a reticence to be like, all right, well, the wizard's going to be in cover because they don't want to always be focused fired. So they just pop out every now and then or like the rogues doing the same thing. And so you're not getting your full attacks. You're not getting everything. You're having to make these reactions. But that's like forcing you to do something different. It's changing the circumstances mm -hmm. of the fight, which is how I see you make it interesting. You know, most D&D &D combats, like you were saying, take place on a flat plane. No matter what the environment is, the once it once combat starts, like this is a flat plane. Well, forests aren't flat planes. You ever been in a forest? Like, <laughs> there's, it's all there's roots everywhere. Terrain. There's holes, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> roots <laughs> and and uh, you know, holes and divots and rocks and old logs and, and all kinds of things, right? So in, in that sense, cover and difficult terrain and height become something that. Uh, that you can use, especially if the enemies are aware of it and it's like their favorite terrain, their uh, home environment that they can use. You can turn like a goblin encounter into something more than, than just like <laughs> beating up on some four low CR enemies by giving them a lot of places to hide, giving them a lot of places to move without being seen or to, you know, mm -hmm. change their position. Mm -hmm. Same with like kobolds, right? Tucker's kobolds are terrifying yeah. not because they're more powerful but because they have set up the terrain to favor them right um, uh well yeah look just look up what the Viet Cong did in vietnam with all their tunnels and just all just that like moving under the battlefield and having like sinkholes uh with i mean they literally had like like spike traps everywhere sure. they're called sure. punji sticks um and they were poisoned uh but same thing. I mean, that's a. I'm pretty sure that's where they get that inspiration from for Tucker's Kobolds. But oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the the fantasy. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's it's pretty. 
it's pretty bad stuff. Like it is, it is, and and you know, I, I think sort of the environmental change is making making uh, players have to like squeeze through something tight to crawl somewhere to get to uh, an enemy, or or uh, you know, if you're thinking for something more magical, creating zones that you don't want to stand in. You don't want the start of your turn <laughs> to be here in this zone, mm -hmm. and and so moving through it, maybe that's okay. I mean, but the way you set up the rules for it and the way you establish like what it triggers on, it's, it can encourage different uh, kinds of movement. Uh, and that could be like spells that your enemies cast or like special abilities that they have, or it could be like features of the environment itself. Um, but yeah, that, that's the first thing I would do. Elevation, cover, um, something that changes, right? Something dynamic mm -hmm. about the environment that is going to change throughout it. And so, some of that's gonna be like just flavor, how you describe mm -hmm. attacks. It's like take a, a fight in a tavern, right? There's other, there's non-combatants all over the place. It's tables, chairs, mugs, cauldrons of, of, of boiling soup. Uh, there's all kinds of things. There's beams that support the roof. All of that should be part of the combat description. And this is where the rulings, not rules, comes into play with 5th edition, is that you can just, like, handle those things on the fly. Like, oh, they hit you with an attack. You stumble back a few feet into a table. It crashes over. The row goes, okay, I'm going to dive under that table. Use that cover there. You know, or I'm going to push a bunch of these non-combatants into an enemy, you know, to to both make room for myself and to like throw them off something like swing from a chandelier right these are all parts of the environment that they're not codified in the rules but if you just think of them first like what is it what's going on in the fiction of the world and then extrapolate from that what the rules would be and and maybe it requires like the players to use one of their you know bonus action reaction part of their action all of their move you know to interact with one of these features but it encourages mm -hmm. a kind of dynamism to combat. Um, and so you can do that in just about uh, just about any environment. My recommendation is to like check out Wikipedia for different biomes and environments and just look at pictures of them, right? Like just scroll through pictures of old growth forests or or you know alpine tundra or something like whatever it is to look and see um, you know what it's like. Impose disadvantage on attacks, you know going back to the kobolds like they're fighting in tunnels that are meant for them not for you and so you're having to hunch mm -hmm. down you're, you're it might just be that like are you wielding anything other than like a light weapon then it's not just disadvantage but you can't even use your proficiency in it you are not using that weapon as intended um yeah right <laughs> Uh, uh, no, yeah, definitely <laughs> like you automatically have disadvantage plus this other thing on top um so that's terrain environment. The other thing I'm thinking about is just tactics, right? Like, don't have your enemies just stand somewhere and shoot. Yeah. <laughs> don't have them just stand somewhere and, like, your big bruisers, sure. That's the locking down the party to keep them in place. But have your skirmishers, your, your snipers, your ranged spell support, all of that should be moving all the time. And if you've got a dynamic environment to... Uh, you know, for them to move in heights, you know, uh, cover, things like that, you know, destructible terrain, then you're signaling to the players that, like, this is a dynamic environment. Your enemies are taking advantage of these things. They're hopping from cover to cover, right? They're never out in the open when it's your turn, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that um, that's going to signal to the players that they can do that too, and, you know, like a lot of things, DMs who want their, to encourage their players to do something, you can model it by how you play your enemies. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would just make sure that the encounters you have, the enemies have a good mix of, of combat types. Like, there's a lot to like about 4th edition, right? Like, it's not all crap. One of the great things about it was monster rolls, you know, and just thinking in terms of what the monsters do in combat and skirmishers, leaders, controllers, brutes, soldiers, whatever it is play to the strengths of that and tailor their special abilities. You know, if you got some brute low level, you know, humanoids, max out their hit dice, right? Give them, bump up their AC one or two points. You know, are, are they snipers? Give them a ranged weapon. Give them a couple, you know, <laughs> increase their proficiency with it. Like you can change anything about these monsters. So change it up, send in groups of mixed, uh, you know, mixed enemy types 
and have them hit the party with a variety of, uh, you know, a variety of tactics. Maybe you don't do that every time. Sometimes the party just steamrolls something in a flat plane, <laughs> you know. But the big battles, the keep it dynamic, those are my two like biggest, uh, biggest tips. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Gonzo's fine. Sometimes the the earth yeah. rips out of its, <laughs> you know, rips out of the ground and floats in the air for a while because that's just what's going to happen here, you know. Like Gonzo for its yeah. own sake, that's okay. But Gonzo, because it makes sense, paradoxically, uh, is even better. <laughs> <laughs>